In this lecture, we will talk about techniques for preconditioning a linear system. So the idea here is that we're given some linear system, ax equal to b, and we want to use an iterative method to solve it. So say a is sparse, so we have a fast technique for applying a to vectors. And uh, many of these iterative techniques we've looked at, so Krylov methods primarily, they tend to converge fast if the eigenvalues of a are clustered. Sometimes having a small condition, condition number is helpful, but in general there's some sort of spectral properties. For each iterative method, there's some sort of spectral properties of A for which you get fast convergence. But of course, in typical applications, we can't choose the matrix A. It's given to us by an application, and uh, if it's not something that plays nicely with the iterative method we want to use, then of course you can look for another iterative method but uh, if, the class, if the spectrum of A is really class scattered all over the place, then most iterative methods are not going to work well. So the idea then, so oftentimes what we do is that we look for some matrix M, such that when you multiply by the inverse, you get a matrix that is nice, whose spectrum is clustered, whose condition number is small, or something like this. And then you just multiply the equation AX equal to B by M inverse from the left, and we get the preconditioned system over here, which then we can expect to solve much faster. And of course, for this to work, you have to be able to apply M inverse rapidly. So, we must be able to apply M inverse rapidly. So of course you don't form M inverse, so this is the same as solve MY equal to C rapidly. So given a vector, can you solve the corresponding linear system? So of course the closer M is to equal A, the better in terms of getting good clustering of uh, M inverse times A, so perhaps what we can do is we can form a spectrum. So on the one hand, what's the perfect preconditioner? So the perfect preconditioner is m equal to a itself. So in this case, you know, solving, <laughs> solving the preconditioned system is very easy. So this is perfect preconditioner but it's useless because solving, solving this system is just as hard as solving the original equation. But this is useless since solving my equal to c is hard. And on the other end, the opposite preconditioner would be picking M to be identity, so this is useless as preconditioner, this is very easy. Now it's very easy to solve MY equal to C, but useless as a preconditioner. So the interesting preconditioners then lie here. So you want to find an M that approximates A sufficiently closely that M inverse times A is nice, and whatever nice means for your iterative method, but uh, simple enough that the system MY equal to C can be solved very easily. So here are interesting preconditioners. So let us mention that there are different ways of doing preconditioning. The one we talked about on the first slide was this one. This is called left preconditioning. You just left multiply by M inverse. Sometimes it's more convenient to do right preconditioning. So you insert M like that and you iterate using the matrix A M inverse. And then when you find the solution to that, you just need to do one solve at the end. If A is symmetric, then we say that both of the first two, these two 
coefficient matrices, neither one of them is necessarily symmetric, it's typically not, but uh, if you precondition like this in the bottom row here, then you get a symmetric uh, iteration matrix, which is oftentimes very convenient. So if you use conjugate gradients or something where the uh, assumption is that the matrix is symmetric. Notice, however, that from a practical point of view, the difference between these approaches is sometimes less than it might seem because many of them are, are identical by a similarity transform, so they have the same spectra. So if we look at the bottom one, for instance, the inverse a c minus star, we can, uh, uh, let's see, so how does this work? So if we multiply by, by c from the left and by c inverse from the right, so now we haven't changed the uh, eigenvalues at all, then this is equal to a times c minus star c inverse so this is A, C, C star, inverse. And we see that this is just a M inverse. So really, which one you use here, it has more to do with practicality. So what is easier to do? Are there you know, physical reasons that matrix have structure that makes one formulation easier to use than another one? But uh, the spectrum is sort of the, in the interesting thing is really what is the spectrum of the preconditioned matrix or whatever other properties you need to get fast convergence. So let's just quickly review some different popular choices. Uh, the idea here is not to um, go into any depth at all, Ex in fact, the opposite, extremely superficial discussion, but just to uh, quickly look at some things that people have tried and are commonly used, I should say, in applications. So the easiest choice is perhaps just to use the diagonal preconditioner. So sometimes you can just extract the diagonal entries. So M is diagonal. And sometimes that really makes a big difference. But of course, in most applications, this is too easy. That won't really help. Something that's slightly more sophisticated it would be to use a block diagonal. So what we do is we form a matrix M where we extract the diagonal blocks from A. So say here's the, using the notation from previously in the class, you just extract the diagonal blocks of, oh, that looks a little funny, but uh, basically you extract the diagonal blocks from A, and now you can invert M relatively easily because each diagonal block can be inverted independently, and if you pick them small enough, this is very cheap. And this is actually surprisingly often a very efficient preconditioner. And a variation of this would be a domain decomposition method, which, remember we talked about this earlier, the idea is simply that you take your computational domain, so this is not the matrix, this is omega, and you split it into little blocks, and then you form the local coefficient matrices and you just invert these. The issue here is that when you do that, you end up to get, you typically get some degrees of freedom that survive on the interfaces. So then you do an iteration on those and you can go back and forth. And this is, this is really conceptually similar. It is sort of doing a block diagonal preconditioner. You just have some, oftentimes some extra degrees of freedom on the interfaces between the nodes that survive. But uh, this can dramatically speed up acceleration. And oftentimes, there are practical considerations that underlie this so that you can use, for instance, a nested dissection scheme to very rapidly solve. Inside each block, so you pick them. So remember, nested dissection, it works very well for small problems or intermediate size problems. So what you do is you pick these domains to be small enough that nested dissection is still very efficient, so say a million degrees of freedom or something and less. And then you factorize once, so you, each of these blocks, you explicitly do an LU factorization. And then after that, you can apply M inverse very rapidly just by doing the corresponding triangular solves. And then you need to do some iterations on the degrees of freedom that survive. Another situation where we uh, may want to use a block preconditioner is a situation where you have, say, you have some scatterers. <coughs> 
and then you have an incoming wave. So we're doing this very quickly. You have an incoming wave, it hits these scatters, the wave bounces back and forth, and then you want to compute the outgoing wave. Then oftentimes what you can do is you can build explicitly the scattering matrix. If you formulate this as an integral, a boundary integral equation, you can invert each piece by itself. So say you have you know a few thousand degrees of freedom on each one, you can easily invert them, and then in order to solve the global system, you do an iteration on the you do an iteration on the whole system that has all the degrees of freedom, and you use the inverses for each block as a preconditioner. Or perhaps if we remember, there was a picture we saw earlier that looks like this. So we were talking about uh, scattering from a body like this, and we saw that it's you, you can build very easily a or very easily, but the methods we have can be used to buy, build the inverse of the of the scattering matrix, or the scattering matrix, I should say, that is the inverse. That is the sort of the inverse of the diagonal block for each one of these. Uh, of these guys, and then you can efficiently do an iteration on the global system. This is not quite right, because those ideas that we talked about, they use an additional property. So they also use that the off-diagonal blocks have low numerical rank. So remember that what we did was that we wrote A as one component that had the diagonal blocks. So you had the diagonal blocks like this. So this was what we call D. And then you had some low rank factorization, like this. And then we actually inverted this structure. So what did we have? U, A tilde, V star. So we had some structure like this. So we used more, but um, we were really looking to build a direct solver, really finding good approximation to A inverse. But this really leads into a very common idea in preconditioning that you have some inkling of how to build a direct solver, but say it just turns out to be too much of a hassle, or it, it turns out to be too expensive. The asymptotic complexity isn't right. So you can do it for a moderate number of degrees of freedom. And then oftentimes um, you can sort of do parts of it. So say you just forget about this part, we just delete this part and use the block diagonal one, and then that is our matrix M. So then the iteration will help you correct for the errors that you made in this very rough approximation. So this is a very common technique. So when we're talking about um, connecting to integral equations, perhaps it's worth recalling our discussion about lipman schwinger So let me write this equation down. So here is the uh, lipman schwinger equation. So what's happening here is that you have some scattering potential that's supported in a finite domain. And so I should have, let me rewrite that. But I wanted to say there's some region where b is non-zero. And other than that, b is zero everywhere else. And then if we're given an incoming wave V, we want to again, just like on the previous slide, compute the outgoing wave U. And the relevant equation then is the lipman schwinger equation. And what we did was that we convolved this equation with the free space solution for the fundamental solution for free space. And then that is the inverse of the dominant part. So it's the inverse of that part. So th this is the sense in which this is preconditioning. There is one component here that I know exactly how to invert. That's not exactly the operator I have, but I pretend that that's the operator I have. And then I apply the inverse. And then remember the equation we ended up with. It looked something like this. I'm sure I'll get the signs wrong here. But it's something along these lines. And then convolution between phi and b of y times v of y dy. So the integrals are in principle over all of 
RT, but you really only need to integrate over the support of B, of course. So the point now is that we have a much nicer operator here on the left. It's identity plus a compact operator. So um, this is a much nicer mathematical equation. So another way you might do this is say you want to solve a variable coefficient problem on a um, on some domain. Now let's make it scalar. So say you want to solve this on, let's just be simple, on some domain omega with some boundary conditions. So this is hard. We don't know how to do this. I mean, we have to discretize. Uh, things get kind of messy. But what we know very well how to solve is the equation. We can solve that equation very efficiently. So we have fast solvers for this. So we can solve this using an FFT-based method. We could use the boundary integral equation, or you know, you just convolve with a free space fundamental solution, and then you need to do some boundary corrections. So solves for this equation are very fast. So maybe you could alternate. You use that, you discretize this equation, and use that as a preconditioner. So a bar here is a constant. So it's what's called a homogenized equation. It's sort of a coarse scale efficient conductivity, say A of X is variable conductivity inside this box here, then A bar is a certain kind of average, the right way of averaging this so that the solution to the equation boxed in red in a certain sense approximates the solution to the variable coefficient problem. It's a poor approximation, but it's sometimes good enough to use as a preconditioner. It's oftentimes good enough to use as a preconditioner. So next, let's talk a little bit about a specific class of problems. So a lot of the interest in preconditioners is, of course, for solving elliptic PDEs, which has been a topic of this course as well. So, but so let's have in mind again our model problem. So many of the techniques we're going to talk about they can be generalized in all sorts of different ways, but to keep things concrete, let's think of the five-point stencil on a uniform grid, such as the one we have over here on the right. So... Um, let us first, first remember why this problem is uh, challenging. So what are the evals of A? So they're basically the Fourier modes. You remember the eigenvectors. They, they look like the Fourier modes. So if this domain, if it's overall of size O of 1, O of 1, and then you have a grid spacing H, then uh, we see that we have long Fourier modes that corresponds to the smallest eigenvalue. So lambda min will be O of 1, whereas the largest ones will scale as 1 over h squared, because the fastest, the mo most rapidly os oscillating eigenmodes will behave sort of like something like this. The fastest frequency you can resolve on this grid, it's 1 over h. So when you differentiate this, you get pi over h, and then you differentiate once more, and you get pi squared over h squared. So the largest eigenvalue tends to scale as 1 over h squared, so we see then that the condition number goes as 1 over h squared. And notice that th this is precisely the tricky situation. So you have the smallest eigenvalue, and then you have the largest one that's very large. And the difficulty here is that the eigenvalues are not at all clustered. They are spread all over here. They're over the entire spectrum at all dynamic ranges, and that's what makes this problem really quite challenging. So another reason why we can't really use um, a plain Krylov method out of the box without a preconditioner is uh, that the matrix A is sparse. It only represents interactions with nearest neighbors. So information doesn't spread very far. So if you start with, say, a uh, right-hand side B. So how do we do this? So data movement, slow data movement. 
So say b i the vector b is um, one for i equal to some specific choice i zero and zero otherwise. So this is i zero. So hard to see. Then what is the support of AB? So support of AB, well, A times B is really only lets A talk to its uh, immediate neighbors. And then what should we use? A the support of a squared b. Uh, now we can talk to that guy, to that guy, to that guy, to that guy, like this. So maybe information can really only spread one grid point per application of a. So what this means is that you must have the number of iterations must be at least Let's use big N to be consistent with notation in the class. So N is total degree of freedom, capital N. And to get across the grid, there's root capital N points. So you have to apply a root N times before the information has even traveled from one end to the other. And after one sweep, it's not accurate. So you need to do several sweeps, and this would be an enormous amount of iterations. So solving AU equal to B, solving this equation, using a cradle method, you pretty much have to use a preconditioner. Otherwise, things just won't work. So what are some choices for preconditioners here? So the first preconditioner we'll discuss for uh, discretized boundary value problems is uh, incomplete LU, which is a very common technique. So we'll consider a linear system, AX equal to B, and we think of A, or A should be sparse, and think of this as a discretized boundary value problem. So the five points then, so here is our standard example, but of course this works for a broad range of different discretizations. So we've talked a lot about techniques for computing an LU factorization of A. And uh, remember that um, the main difficulty here is that you get fill in in the factors. So even though A can be very sparse, L and U typically are not. So then the idea of incomplete LU is um, to just do this approximately. So we'll do A approximately equal to L times U. And typically what's done is that you enforce L and U to have the same sparsity pattern as A. So you just don't fill in the entries that so when you do the Gaussian elimination, you get entries, non-zero entries popping up. And if they sit in a spot where A is not non-zero, then you just don't fill in that one. So you don't get an exact factorization. In fact, it's, it's very approximate. But sometimes this works well enough as a preconditioner. So this then is your definition of M. So M inverse A, in this case, it would be to apply that, you would apply A and then do two triangular solves with uh, U and L. And this oftentimes works. If, um, of course, the, in principle, there's some, you know, there's some permutations here, but um, yeah, that's, you, you know what to do for that. If A is symmetric, then the equivalent would be Cholesky. And what you do is A is approximately equal to L, L star. That's your definition of M. And then AX equal to B, you rewrite as um, L inverse A, L inverse transpose, L transpose X is equal to L inverse B. So this is now your preconditioned system, and the point here is that that matrix, the system matrix, is now symmetric again. So there are lots of things you can do um, 
along these lines, you could do uh, a uh, partial LU. So say you take a few steps of nested dissection, but you stop after some number of levels. So basically, nested dissection, or a multifrontal method, and you stop after a few levels. So then you get a factorization, a is equal to L a tilde u. So in principle, when you do this, you drive this all the way. So a tilde is driven to, um, to the identity matrix, but you stop at some point. And then you use these factors L and u as your preconditioners. So this is similar to a block preconditioner, but the difference is that now we actually form the true complements explicitly. Then, of course, you can also do coarse direct solvers. So remember that in a direct solver, so a fast direct solver, so this is based on rank truncation, so you fix an epsilon, and then you build some matrix B such that A inverse minus B is within distance epsilon. Or you do some approximation, A minus A tilde is within distance epsilon, and then sets the approximation. Sometimes we have an exact immersion formula for A tilde, and you do something like this. So in the course, we've mostly thought about epsilon as being very, very small. But the idea here is that you can maybe use, say, epsilon is not so small. And then your, the approximate inverse you build is oftentimes, it's an, oftentimes an extremely good preconditioner. And uh, notice that this matters. Picking a large epsilon can increase improvement, can improve performance a lot, because you typically have some relation that the ranks scale as 1 over epsilon, and then the complexity scale as k squared or something, k squared times n. So if you reduce epsilon, you can really accelerate things a lot. Or, you know, sometimes you even have k scaling as log squared or of the epsilon. So the next method we'll talk about is ADI or alternating directions implicit. So we'll discuss it for the simple case for a standard model problem of the fine point stencil on a regular grid, as shown over here on the right. So in this case, the uh, coefficient matrix in, so we have our equation ax equal to b, and now a takes on a particular form. So it's a sum of a1 plus a2, where these represent the x1 derivatives and the x2 derivatives, the second derivatives in either case. So now, the thing is that if we had just one of these two, then it would be very easy because then A would be block, it would be a blocked matrix and each block would be um, just a tridiagonal matrix. So you would order the grids column-wise for the one and uh, row-wise for the other. And in that case, each block would just be a tridiagonal matrix system that's uncoupled. So notice that when you do this, so let's see, so the A1 matrix, so the X1 derivatives, Notice these are completely uncoupled, so each set of nodes, they just talk to each other. There's, they don't talk to the other guys. And uh, then likewise, the A2 operators, they would, you know, just act on each block of nodes like that. And uh, try diagonal systems, we can solve extremely rapidly, so you could you could very easily invert A1 or A2, respectively. But of course, this would be inaccurate. But you can use it as a preconditioner. So the idea would be that if we have some approximate solution, so say x is an approximate solution, 
maybe we could iterate. So what you do is you solve you solve a system that involves only a one as the coefficient matrix. So this then would be b minus a two x, and then you would uh, do it again with a two. Um, maybe I shouldn't have called that x new. How do we do this? Let's call that x prime instead. Because now I want to put that on the right hand side. Like that. Right, so you solve this for x double prime and uh, this hopefully gets you a little bit closer to the solution. It's an approximate inverse. And this by itself, you could just do this repeatedly and iterate, and sometimes that converges. Um, but you can certainly use it as a preconditioner, and that can uh, be quite effective in some applications. So next, let's uh, discuss so-called coarse grid approximation techniques. So the idea here is that, so first of all, recall so the reason that this problem is challenging to solve is that we have the smallest eigenvalue scales as 1 when you discretize an elliptic PD like this, and then the largest one scales as 1 over h squared. So kappa then is roughly 1 over h squared. And if h is very small, then this can get large quickly. So the idea now is that we pick a some larger scale Okay, so my grid is too small, 6 by 6 is not enough to illustrate this, but you take some grid size that's larger than your fine resolution. And then what we do is that we, uh, we use the discretization at the scale capital H as um, the preconditioner. So let's see, how do we do this? So let a course... be a discretization at scale h, big H. Then kappa of a course scales is 1 over big H squared. So now what you do is that you build your preconditioner as, so there's some Transfer to fine grid is what you do at the end. Okay, so this is a little backwards. We have to I'll explain once I finish writing. And I'm following Trefethen and Bao in their description of this. So the, so the idea is this. So a course, of course, is a much worse discretization of the PD than A is. So it's not a good approximate inverse to A. You're going to get a quite inaccurate answer if you use just a course, but it sometimes works as a preconditioner. So the idea is that you start with an X that's tabulated on the fine grid, and then you project this up to A, or you project it onto the coarser grid. So you do some sort of aggregation, you know, you take, say, say H is maybe not quite, say H is, oops, if, all right, so say H is double the grid size, say you have H like that then what you would do is you could, for instance, form the average, say, of four nodes. That turns out to not be the very best way of doing it, I don't think, but um, there are various ways of doing this way. You see, you project up onto a coarser grid, and then you solve the problem there. It has a smaller condition number, so you can do use an iteration there that will converge faster. 
and then you transfer down to the fine grid. And notice that this also helps with the information propagation problem that we mentioned some time ago that each time you apply A, you can really only move information one grid point across. And by going up to a coarser grid, we can now, each, each application of A course moves information one over, or it moves inf information to distance capital H, which you can pick much larger than little h. So this is an interesting idea, but where this becomes really interesting, where this becomes very powerful, is if you use many grids, which is multigrid. So you use a whole, so you use a, um, several grids. So you have your fine grid, so the finest level, so this works, you've seen these hierarchical schemes, so the finest one would be the, the original grid. And then you go up, so level L minus 1, you get 2H. Level L minus 2, you get 4H, 8H, and so on. And then what you can show. So now what's interesting is that if you restrict, so when you iterate on the different grids, you're going to get very fast convergence of the uh, longest length scale. And uh, those typically converge very quickly now, because if you restrict the operator to the relevant length scale, then it's really well conditioned for that length scale. So just one or two iterations of many of these standard iterative methods will improve the error a lot. So you, um, so you do just one or two iterations on each length scale, and you go up and down. And if you do this a couple times, then uh, it turns out that this often converges very, very quickly. And notice that this also completely deals with this problem of transfer of information because on the course on the coarsest grids, in just one iteration will move information across the entire domain, and uh, a lot of the actual production codes are based on multigrid. It's really one of the most important solvers. So we're not going to talk about that much in this class. It's a topic for a different, for several different lectures or a whole other class. Let's just look at, I snagged a picture from a publication, so I took this from publication down here, and you see sort of the idea, so you, you form the residual. So up here we have the original problem, really, which uh, you saw, you form the residual, and you do maybe one solve there, you restrict to the next course, or you do one iteration there, and... Um, you go down, so and then you do a solve or one iteration on the coarsest grid, and then you go back. And a few cycles of this tends to improve the error a lot. And um, yeah, I encourage you to read up on this. These are very interesting methods, but outside the scope of this lecture. So that should wrap things up.